Good evening, Saints. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church midweek service. While I'm thinking about it, if you have not subscribed to this channel, please do so, and we will notify you every time we have a, a new video. It's usually twice a week. We are in the seventh chapter of Romans. Tonight we're going to cover who is this man that Paul is talking about. I won't say this will be the best sermon that you ever heard on the subject. At the same time, it probably won't be the worst. I hope um, as we go through this that it will cause you to want to search the Scriptures. Because I could be wrong. Um, but at, we're going to start at verse 14 and go through 25. Then we will go back and recap. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would do, I do not. But what I hate, that I do. If there, if then I do which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not. The evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more that I do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find in the law, when I would do good, evil is present within me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I also serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Now, I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again tonight. I am deeply indebted throughout this series to several authors. One of them is Martin Lloyd-Jones. Another one is um, Randy Seaver. Another one is um, Blake White. Another one is um, um, John Murray. And... Um, these don't all agree. I don't just read people I agree with. Um, but as we take a look at this passage, I think um, we want to uh, say there are three possibilities here of what this is talking about. The first is Paul is describing an unregenerate or an unsaved man or person. Two, He's describing a regenerate person even at his best. Or he's describing an, a non-mature regenerate person. As we um, look into church history, we find out many of the early church fathers believe the first one, that Paul is describing an unregenerate person. Uh, however, if you look at what they write, they're not the best scholars in the world, and they were all over the map. So I'm not going to say that you should read them or not read them. That's up to you. In the second group, Paul describes a regenerate even at his best. Uh, Charles Hodge and Robert Haldane would be examples of those. And the third group... Paul describes a non-mature saved person. Well, your Arminians and your second blessing theology would be that group. You may or may not agree with that, but that, or you might even want to add to that. But um, as I said, have said previously during this study, um, this is not Paul's personal experience as such. What he is teaching is about our relationship 
to the law. What it does, what it does not do, what it cannot do, what the truth is about the law. And we have looked over the last few weeks and we know that uh, what the law does is it shows us our sin. What it does not do, it does not justify us, it does not sanctify us. And indeed it cannot justify or sanctify us. But it does tell us the truth about what the law is and what our relationship to it is. Let's look at verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual. That right, that statement right there sort of gives you a heads up that this is not an unregenerate person. Why? Because an unregenerate person would never say the law is spiritual. If you look in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, we're going to be looking tonight at quite a few places. Um, 2 Corinthians... Who also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So... For a person to say that the law is spiritual, he has to be an under he has to be a regenerate person to know that. And then it says, "But I am carnal." And what does that mean? Well, it, ha it could have two meanings. One, it means you're in the flesh. That means you would be unregenerate. But as but as I said, the first statement says that you are a regenerate person. So we'll take that one out. The other one is that you're immature. If you look in the First Corinthians 3, where Paul writes this letter, he says, Brothers, I could not speak unto you as though you were spiritual, but as carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So if you're in Christ, you are regenerate. You have to be regenerated or born again to be in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. So uh, it could be that type of person he is talking about. Um, it's either a mature Christian or it's not a mature Christian. Whatever else is being taught, though, this cannot be an unregenerate person because the law would, um, the lost would never say, "Oh, the law is spiritual, and I want to." I want to do my best. Well, let's look at it this way. At my best, at your best, at anyone's best, you can pick any name you want to throughout history, but Jesus Christ, at our best, we cannot keep the law as it was supposed to be kept. Adam kept it when he was first created until he sinned. And when he sinned, God had to have a second Adam, so he sent Jesus Christ. He's the only other person that has kept the law. See, what an unregenerate person would say is, not that I can't keep the law. He says, I'm okay. I'm not perfect, but I'm okay, and you're okay. That's what they say. But Paul says, I was alive without the law, but the command came, and although before then I was doing very well, I died. We covered that a couple of weeks ago. But the Bible tells us where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And grace much more abounds in the person that is saved. What? So, what could this be talking about? What if you're trying to live as a saint by the law? See, we have been putting forth in this study is we don't live by the law. We die to the law. But what if you're a saint and you you uh, are a member of a church and they put emphasis on law keeping. They have put you under the law. And here you are, you're saying, I can't do that. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing because we know that the law stirs up sin in us. 
And in this church, you've been told that the law is in three parts, and the third use of the law is is a guide for believers. Well, under new, the new covenant, that's no longer true. There, there was no three parts of the law in the Old Testament. It was all one. And whatever you disobeyed, it didn't matter if it was a dietary law, if it was a civil law, or if it was a, a law that was like you shall not kill. If you violated it, you violated the law. It, it didn't have parts to it. But we've been told in Colossians 2.6, which we will get to in a minute, that if you're in Christ, you live like you received Him. So, uh, we know it cannot be the third group here, the entire sanctification or the sinless perfection, because I don't know anybody that is uh, sinless. Do you? Except God? He's the only one. Nor can it be a partial saint. See, there's some people that say, well, this is the time between your being in Adam and coming to Christ. I don't see that in the Scriptures. There's no in-between time. You're either in Adam or in Christ. There's no third group. So we'll throw that one out. But what if it's a person that has not been taught that he died to sin? It could be a poorly taught person. And I think that's exactly what this is. He's living as if he's under the law and he's looking to his performance to being acceptable. It's like if you were a child in a house and you thought in order to be accepted by your parents you had to do everything that just so. And yet they love you because you're their child, not because you perform. But see, we treat God that way, don't we, sometimes? that if we perform better, if we do this, He will give us that. But in 7.22, look, look, at, look at this one. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. No sinner delights in the law of God. So what do we do? We keep our eyes on Jesus. We adore Him. We don't go by our performance. Did I read my... I'm not saying you don't do this. I'm just saying you're not accepted by your performance. I mean, if you want to know who Jesus is, you've got to read the Bible. You've got to pray. And then you will know. Think about it this way. If I look at the law and all its demands, and the demands is this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength all the time. And none of us do that. We get distracted. We let the cares of the world come in sometimes. And we lose um, our... We take our eyes off Jesus. You know like Peter was when he was walking on the water? He saw the winds and waves and he began to sink because he took his eyes off Jesus. Well, we do that. So, Paul is saying the fact that we want to please God is good, but we're not to judge, be judged on how well we do that, okay? As you received Christ, now this is Colossians 2 6, as you received Christ, therefore walk in Him. How did you receive Christ? Through faith. Well, walk through faith. That's what he's saying. And in Galatians, Paul even works this out a little bit better that we can understand it. And um, that's in Galatians, the third chapter. He says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This is the only thing I want to know. Did you learn uh, Jesus by faith through hearing the Word, or by doing something. That's what he's asking. He says, um, Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Evidently, it's hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by law? 
by doing stuff. No. We're not made perfect by trying to keep up with the law. If you keep your eyes on the law, one or two things can happen to you. One, you might become legalistic. That means you measure your success and your brothers and sisters' success by your code of conduct. And it may not be a biblical code of conduct. It could be, well, my skirt's longer than yours, so I'm better than you are. Or my sleeves are longer than yours. That's what the Pharisees did. They had these long robes and they put the tassels on them. And the tassels were supposed to be some kind of uh, thing that gave them uh, righteousness, as it were. Or you might be the other type of person that you, you find out you can't do it so you just give up and do whatever you want to do. And neither one of those are good. Those are both bad. The answer to that is Jesus Christ Himself. The Gospel. This is what follows for any man who relies on the law for sanctification or the man that's not even a Christian and he wants to earn his way into heaven by self-effort. He fails. There's no self-salvation projects for either the saint or the sinner. We're saved by grace. Verse 14. Carnal acting. These people in Corinth acted as if they weren't believers. They were divided into factions. Oh, Paul is my hero. Peter is my hero. I like Apollos. Oh, Jesus, I'm better than y'all. Jesus is my hero. And uh, Paul had to rebuke each one of those. Verse 15, it tells us, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. What I hate, that's, I, that's what I do. Now he's talking about... Um, Every day I get up and I want to seek God and love Him with all my heart. And I can't. And I don't want the cares of this world to keep me from worshiping God, but I do. You see what I'm saying? We're not talking about somebody that goes out and, and closes the bar down every night at 2 o'clock or whatever time it is. Although there might be a season in a saint's life where he would do something like that. Or she would do something like that. In verse 16, sort of repeats itself in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Paul says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So he's talking about on the inside we are wanting to be what God wants us to be. We want to be like Jesus, in other words. And yet, sometimes we just can't because of the limitation of this unglorified body that we have. The inward man, he talks about, let me see which verse this is. Okay, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. The law of my mind. That's where the Spirit has come in and given us the mind of Christ. And we see there are things that distract us and keep us from doing that. We get tired. Or we get caught up in rearing our children or working on our job and we don't do what we should do. We don't take time for God. And we know that that is not right. Number 22, I delight in the law. As I said, the inward man, no unsaved person delights in the law. So this is not about an unsaved person. He sees a different law, though. Warring against the law of my mind, I delight in the law, what he wills, versus the warring law that does not will to do what God wants to do. You know, I'll put it all. I'll do it another day. And then verse 24 says, wretched man that I am. I'm miserable. I don't like this. He's saying a sin 
in a Christian's life will be there, but it won't make the Christian happy. He wants to get rid of the sin, whereas the unsaved person doesn't care. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all not perfect, and so we'll do what we want to do, and God in the end is going to save us all. No, He's not. To quote Martin Luther, the Reformer, when I look at myself, how can I be saved? How many times have I failed God over and over again? But when I look at Christ, how can I be lost? He paid for all my sins, my past sins, my present sins, my future sins. I want to be like Him. I want to hang around Him. I want to please Him. It's like being married. You want to please your spouse. That's what He's saying. And He's saying, Who can deliver me out of this body of death? This sort of goes along with Romans 6.6. 6. Knowing this, our old man is crucified with Him that the body of sin might be destroyed. This body of sin is going to be destroyed one day. When Christ comes in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and it's going to be gone is what He's talking about here. Because within this body of death is the wages of sin. Do you, especially if you got some years on you, you want to live in this body forever? I don't. I want that glorified body that Christ talks about. So he says, Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. This is not a despairing cry. This is a cry of ecstasy as it was. If you look in 1 Corinthians 15, O oh death, where is your sting? See, we're longing for the second coming where our bodies will be changed. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is a law. The thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the victory already. We just need to believe it. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and not on our performance. We see in uh, Romans 8 chapter... I'll find it here in a minute. 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. We only have the first fruits of the Spirit. We're longing for what's to come. Even ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Yes, God is coming back to give us a new body that will last forever, eternally young looking and will not wear out like he had when he was risen from the dead because he is the first fruits of them that slept. We see in Second Corinthians five four. For we are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. Yes, we want the mortality to be swallowed up by the second coming and Jesus just giving us His glory as He promised. And the blessed hope, that's in Titus 2.13, looking unto Jesus, the author. I'll find it here in a minute. looking unto that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, we are looking for that. We are eagerly waiting for that. Who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Notice He didn't say we purify ourselves. He purifies us. We look to Him. He purifies us. Instead of trying to perform for Him, He clothes us in His righteousness. So, Isaiah says, Look unto Christ, all the ends of the earth, and be saved, for He is God. 
and at his name every knee will bow every tongue will confess in Hebrews the second chapter um, 12th chapter I'm sorry it's got a 2 in it wherefore seeing we also are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses as the Old Testament saints let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily besets us let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus not our performance the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is sat down at the right hand of God because he has finished what he set out to do for us so we look back to Christ who gave himself for us and we look forward to the future for the Christ that's coming back to get us because he wants to be with us Okay, saints, have you ever messed up so badly that you wanted to walk away from the church? Me too. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, he says. If we look in the 11th chapter, we see a hall of fame of Old Testament saints. And some of them were some rogues. You can read about them. It was... Abel, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, the people of Israel, Rahab, Gideon, Samson, Jephthah, David, the prophets, and many more. These were all commended for their faith, but they did not receive the promise. And in fact, he said they were not to be made complete without us. He tells us to look to Jesus. When we sin, we usually look at ourselves instead of looking to Jesus probably because we're ashamed. But Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith and we're to trust Him. He, for the joy, and we'll be back to that in a minute, took our blame, declaring all who would believe blameless. You're blameless if you're in Christ. And took our shame, making us shameless. We're blameless and shameless in Christ. In the cross we see glory, power, and perfect love for us. If Christ took our blame and shame, we should know that He took the blame and shame of all the ones believing so we don't have it anymore. If you're in Christ, you don't have any blame or shame. Look to Him. Claim that. One other thing. The joy. Set before Him. Who is the joy? It's all of the ones who trust in Christ. He went to the cross willingly to claim His inheritance. What was that inheritance? All the ones that the Father gave Him. And the Holy Spirit is out bringing those people to Christ every day through the proclamation of the Word. Share Christ. If you're blameless and shameless, you have a story to tell. And... As we look at this, which we will dive into beginning next week, the next verse is Romans 8 1. Listen to this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, saved by